As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. My friend, today we're wrapping up our series called Christmas, The Rest of the Story. And you'll see on the screen behind me a picture of the crucifixion. You say, what does that have to do with Christmas? Isn't that about Easter? Well, today you're going to find out the crucifixion is a big part of the Christmas story. But thank you for being with me for all of these programs. And I want you to know that today is the last day we're offering you the full series, which is called Christmas, The Rest of the Story. It's 15 parts, and it comes in multiple formats. The subtitle says, Amazing Insights. Is it true? Have you gotten amazing insights from this series? It just feeds my soul and spirit when I dive into this story. I pray that it's been feeding you too. But the subtitle says, Amazing Insights About Christmas You've Never Heard Before. I'd be interested to know what you've learned that you've never heard before. But this comes with a great study guide. And today is also the last day that we're offering the book called Christmas, The Rest of the Story. My friends, please order this. And by the way, you don't have to use this book just at Christmas time. This is a book that you can put on your coffee table because it's so beautifully illustrated. People who come to see you or your grandkids will open it and will flip through the pages. And while they're looking at all the beautiful full color illustrations, they're going to learn so much about Jesus that they never knew. It will thrill them just like it thrills me and just like it's going to thrill you. But you can order all of these things by going online or by giving us a call. And please let us know how to pray for you. We really want to pray for you. I know this is a time of the year when you're really needing wisdom about how to respond to relatives, what to say to this person, what not to say to that person. And maybe you feel like you're under a financial pinch because there's so many things you need to buy or to spend money on. But my friends, we would love to pray for you. You don't have to bear that by yourself. The Bible tells us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And if you will reach out to us, we'll get under that with you in prayer. And our mutual prayer together will help you carry it a lot better. And God will give you the power you need to sail through this season in victory. But let us know how to pray by calling us now or by sending us your email. But watch this and then I'll be right back. The holiday season always brings about fond memories and cherished traditions. For many, one of those cherished traditions is the reading of the Christmas story. In Rick Renner's timeless new book, Christmas, The Rest of the Story, your family can uncover the beautiful details of the nativity story you have never heard. When I was growing up, I heard the same Christmas story year after year, and I loved it. When I got older, I found treasures in the Christmas story that no one had shared with me. And that's what is in this book, and I wrote it to share with you and for you to share with those whom you love. Through its detailed watercolor illustration, Christmas, the rest of the story, invites families to explore the true meaning of Christmas as they interact with the story across decorated pages in a coffee table size format. When you call or go online right now to pre-order this book for just $35, you'll receive the eternal story of Christmas, now beautifully told in this timeless keepsake. Christmas is a special time when you can pass your faith on to your children and grandchildren. With this engaging new book, you can reinforce the true meaning of Christmas, Jesus, the Savior of the world. With magnificent illustrations across nearly 300 pages, your family will create a special tradition that will last for generations. Great as a gift or enhancing your own traditions, pre-order the book Christmas, The Rest of the Story for just $35. Call now or go to renner.org to order. Don't miss this special Christmas offer. This entire series has been about Christmas, the rest of the story. But when we think of Christmas, we usually think about a little baby who is laid in a manger in Bethlehem. But my friends, 
The story of Christmas is not just to give us the sweet picture of a little baby. Certainly it is miraculous. That's why I've written the entire book called Christmas, the rest of the story. But when Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes and was laid in that manger, he appeared in the very beginning as the little lamb of God that was born to take away the sin of the world. And the real purpose of Christmas is the crucifixion and the resurrection. Jesus died as the Lamb of God. He was born to be the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. When our sons were young, Denise and I would gather them together around our Christmas tree. And before we would open a single gift, first, we would go through all of these Christmas details that I've been sharing with you. All of this began by what we experienced as a family. Every year, we shared all these amazing details about Jesus' birth, and we always wrapped it up by saying, remember, boys, what Christmas is really about. And I would tell them, don't just think of a baby in a manger, because Christmas is about so much more. It's about God coming to earth in human flesh, so he could die on the cross to pay for your salvation and destroy all the works of the devil in your life. This is what Christmas is really all about. And at this time of the year, when people are celebrating the birth of Christ, let's remember the real focus. Jesus came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And Paul writes about this remarkably in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8 when he says, and being found in fashion as a man. Mm. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He says he was found in fashion as a man. That is just amazing to me because that word fashion, the Greek word schema, was borrowed from an ancient tale of a king. A king who wanted to be with his people but could not because he was the king. He was so glorious. If he walked among his people, he would be mobbed, but he really longed to be with his people. So the king, according to the tale, one night said, hey, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my clothes. I'm going to remove my royal garments. I'm going to dress like a beggar or like a normal citizen. I'm going to slip out of my palace and show up on the streets and walk among my people and experience them. And he did, and no one even knew who he was. And now Paul, who is very intelligent, knows history, knew the use of that word, and he uses it to tell us a moment finally came when God so wanted to be with us and to redeem us that God removed all of his glorious attributes and took upon himself the form of a servant. He slipped out of the majestic realms of heaven and showed up in the earth as a baby, and according to John chapter 111, he looked so much like a human being. He came unto his own, his own received him not. They didn't even know who he was, but for 33 years he lived among us. And at the end of those 33 years, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Let's talk about that word humble. This particular word for humble means to be humble, to be lowly, but it depicts one who is willing to stoop to any measure that is needed. Think how much humility God had. If you think it's difficult for you to stoop to a lower level to accommodate somebody else, then stop and think about what God did for you. God removed all his attributes of glory. He left his comfort zone. And God stooped to an unbelievable level, reaching into the natural realm that he created, took upon himself flesh and was made in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Think how much humility it would take for Almighty God, the Creator, to be subject to his creation. But that's what he did because he loved you and because he loved me. And the verse goes on to say he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And the word obedient is so very important because Jesus became obedient. It tells us this was not a pleasurable experience. It was not something he looked forward to. And in fact, when you read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says he despised the cross and despised the shame of it. Jesus understood what he would have to endure on the cross. He would hang there naked with his world before his body before a watching world. It was a shame and he despised it, but he knew he would see the results and the results would be you and me coming to know him. He would pay the price for the forgiveness of sin. 
And Philippians 2 verse 8 says, He humbled himself unto death. The word unto means to such an extent, even the death of the cross. The word even can be translated even if you can imagine it. In fact, the verse carries this idea. Can you imagine it? Jesus humbled himself to such a lowly position and became so obedient that he even stooped low enough to die the miserable death of a cross. And my friends, in the first century, there was no death more miserable than the death of the cross. In fact, crucifixion was so horrible that Seneca and Lucia, two famous teachers, said suicide was preferable to crucifixion because crucifixion was simply so miserable. But I'm going to read to you today from my notes because I really want you to understand about crucifixion. At the time that Jesus was crucified, crucifixion was nearly entirely in the hands of Roman authorities and it was reserved for the most serious offenders, particularly for those who rebelled against the government or tried to overthrow the government. Because Israel hated the occupying force of Rome, there were people who tried to overthrow it and to make an example of those subverters, Rome crucified them and made their deaths very, very miserable. And by public, publicly crucifying those who tried to overthrow the government, they sent a signal to everybody else, don't you ever try to do this. But once the person to be crucified had reached the place where the crucifixion was to occur, he was laid on the cross beam he carried with his arms outstretched. Most people think that Jesus carried the entire cross, but he carried the cross beam, which was then lowered into the top of the upright post. Then a soldier would have driven a five inch iron nail through each of his wrists, not the palm of his hands, but through his wrists directly into the cross beam. And after being nailed to the cross beam, the crossbeam was then hoisted up by a rope and the crossbeam was dropped into a notch on the top of the upright post. And when the crossbeam dropped into the groove, the victim suffered excruciating pain as his hands and wrists were wrenched by the sudden jerking motions. And the weight of the victim's arms caused his arms to be pulled out of their arm sockets. And Josephus, the great Jewish historian, wrote that Roman soldiers, out of rage and hatred, amused themselves by nailing prisoners in different positions. This is just horrible what they did. But once the victim's wrists were secured in place on the crossbeam, the feet came next. First, the victim's legs would be positioned so that the feet were pointed downward with the soles pressed against the post on which the victim was suspended. And a long nail would then be driven between the bones of his feet, lodged firmly enough between those bones to prevent it from tearing through the feet as the victim arched upward, gasping for breath, because when the victim was hanging on the cross, he slumped and it made it difficult for him to breathe. But in order for the victim to breathe, he had to push himself up by the feet, which were nailed to the vertical beam. I want you to try to imagine what that would feel like to push up on your feet, which are nailed to an upright post. Think of the pain you would feel in your feet. And because the pressure on his feet became unbearable, it wasn't possible for him to remain long in this position. So eventually he would collapse back down into the hanging position and as the victim pushed up and collapsed back down again and again over a very long period of time, his shoulders eventually dislocated and popped out of joint. And soon the out of joint shoulders were followed by the elbows and wrists. And we're told by historians that these various dislocations caused the arms to be extended up to nine inches longer than usual which resulted in terrible cramps in the victim's arm muscles and making it impossible for him to pull himself upward any longer to breathe. The longer his arms became, the harder it was for him to push up enough to breathe. And when he was finally too exhausted and could no longer push himself upward on the nail lodged in his feet, the process of asphyxiation began. 
Jesus experienced all of this on the cross. When he dropped down with a full weight of his body on the nails that were driven through his wrists, it sent horrific, excruciating pain up his arms to register in his brain. And added to this was the agony caused by the constant grating of his recently scourged back. Remember, his back had been ripped open by a scourging. Adding to the agony was the constant grating of his recently scourged back against the upright post every time he pushed up to breathe and then collapsed back to a hanging position. And due to the extreme loss of blood and hyperventilation, the victim would begin to experience severe dehydration was exactly the reason why John 19, 28, Jesus cried out and said, I thirst. He was experiencing hyperventilation and severe dehydration. And after several hours of this, the victim's heart would begin to fail. Next, his lungs would collapse and excess fluids would begin filling the lining of his heart and his lungs, adding to the slow process of asphyxiation. When the Roman soldiers would normally come to determine whether a person was alive or dead, they would check them out to see if they were breathing or not. But when the Roman soldier came to determine whether or not Jesus was alive or dead, he thrust his spear into Jesus' side. And one expert has pointed out that if Jesus had been alive when the soldier did this, the soldier would have heard a loud sucking sound caused by air being inhaled past the freshly made wound in his chest. But the Bible explicitly says that water and blood mixed together came pouring forth from the wound that the spear had made. And it was evidence that Jesus' heart and lungs had shut down and were filled with fluid. He was already dead. He was already dead. It was customary for Roman soldiers to break the legs of those being crucified so they could no longer push up to breathe. But there was no need to break Jesus' legs because he was already dead, which was also a fulfillment of Psalm 22 when the Bible declared not a bone of his body would be broken. Wow, it is just amazing what the scripture prophesied and what Jesus went through to purchase our salvation. Listen to this, Jesus' naked body was flaunted in humiliation before a watching world. He was naked on that cross. His flesh was ripped to shreds. If you've seen paintings of Jesus with just a few marks across it, his body, you have missed the whole picture. His body was literally ripped to shreds. His body was bruised from head to toe. This is what Peter tells us in the book of Peter. He says he saw his bruised body, my friends. It describes a full body welt. Jesus was swollen. His entire body was bruised. He had to heave his body upward for every breath that he breathed. His nervous system sent signals of excruciating pain to his brain and blood drenched Jesus' face and streamed down from his hands, his feet, and from the gaping wounds the scourging had left upon his body. Now today, people like to wear the cross in their ears. They like to wear it around their neck, and that's fine. Today, people are even tattooing the cross on their body. But it's kind of given us a twisted image of the cross. We think it's a beautiful symbol. But in fact, the cross of Jesus Christ was a disgusting, repulsive, nauseating, stomach-turning sight. My friends, if you really saw what the cross was, it would simply, it would simply be nauseating to you. But that's why Jesus came. God Almighty came to this earth, formed in the womb of the Virgin Mary as a little infant that was born in that cave in Bethlehem for one purpose. Here it is. So that we one day would die the death of a cross to purchase our salvation. And in this season, when everybody is talking about the little baby in the manger, we need to remember Jesus was born as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of of the world. That's why he came. And that's what Christmas is really all about. And for Jesus to humble himself, even to the death of the cross demonstrates how much he was willing to go the distance to redeem me 
and to redeem you, can you say, Amen? And because of his willingness to do it, Philippians chapter 2, 9 to 11 goes on to say, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And according to this verse, a day is coming in the future when every knee shall bow. That word bow means to bow low or to bow before the ultimate authority. One day, every knee will bow. Those who believe will bow. Those who don't believe will bow. Those that are already in hell, even a day will come when they will bow. And not only will they bow, but this verse says they will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word confess in Greek means to audibly, vocally, publicly declare a fact, to speak it out, to yell it out, to declare it out loud, which means heaven, earth, and hell will resound with the voices of all who have ever lived with one thunderous acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord. Everyone is going to do it. The question is from where they will do it. If you declare Jesus is Lord now, it will guarantee you a place in heaven. You're going to do it now or later. But if it's later for you, if you do it from hell, you will acknowledge Jesus as Lord and you will bow your knee before him, but it will be too late for you to gain a place in heaven. And that is why it's so important that you do it now. And this leads us back to the purpose of Christmas. If you have a friend or if you have a relative that does not know Jesus, why not use this season to remind them that Christmas is more than just a little baby who was laid in a manger. That baby was born with the cross in mind. That baby was born to hang on a cross, to die as the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. Is there any better gift that you could give to somebody for Christmas this year than to tell them the good news that Jesus paid the price for their sin to be forgiven and for the authority of Satan to be broken over their lives? When that baby was laying in that manger, in the distance was the cross. That is why he was manifest. The scripture says, For this reason was the Son of God manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's what Christmas, my friend, is really all about. So this year, in addition to talking about the baby in the manger, talk about the cross. Because my friend, it's really all about the cross and what Jesus did on the cross for me and for you. I'll be back in just a moment and I want to pray for you. Do you really know the story of Christmas? Is there more to the story about the birth of our Savior than what you've been told? In this series, Christmas, The Rest of the Story, Rick Renner dives deep into the parts of the Christmas story that most people have never heard. Rick says, I've studied this story for decades, and I found fabulous treasures no one ever shared with me. In this series, we explore the Bible, history, historical writings, and so much more, so we can really understand all the events that took place surrounding the birth of Jesus. Rick answers questions like, why did God choose Mary? Was Joseph really a carpenter? Why was Herod so troubled by Jesus' birth? Who were the Magi? And what was the estimated value of their gifts? This 15-part documentary-type series is available in digital or physical format, starting at just $24. And we're excited to also offer you Rick's stunning new book, Christmas, The Rest of the Story, for a special new release price of $35. It's a book you'll want to share with friends and family at this time of the year. This hardcover, 300-page, fully illustrated book is a keepsake that friends and family will pass on to future generations. Don't miss this special offer, the series, Christmas, The Rest of the Story, and the beautiful book, Christmas, The Rest of the Story. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and today I am standing in the foyer of Rick Renner Ministries in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I just wish I could pick you up and bring you here to see all the wonderful ministry that is happening in this facility where we receive thousands and thousands of phone calls from people just like you who reach out to us for prayer and for teaching they can trust. Proverbs 10:21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many, 
and we know that's our job. Our job is to feed many. And I want to say thank you to you for everything you've helped us do with your giving. You helped us construct our studio, purchase this building, and now in phase three of our ministry expansion program, we're wanting to pay this facility off so we can liberate all that money to take the teaching of the Bible around the world on additional channels and venues. And by being a part of our giving team, you can really help us make this happen. If you're not already a part of our giving team, please pray about joining us. And together we can join hands and through teaching of the Bible and by ministering to people that reach out to us and by sending teaching products around the world, we can really change people's lives. And it's amazing to me that today it's never been easier to make an impact in somebody else's life right from where you are. So thank you for praying about being a part of our giving team. And the moment you join, I want you to really expect the power of God to show up in your life. Well, today we've concluded our series called Christmas, the rest of the story. And my friends, I want to tell you the real purpose of Christmas was not just a baby laying in a manger. It was Jesus dying on the cross as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. That's my sin and that's your sin. And if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, this is the day for you to say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. And if you want somebody to pray with you, call us right now and we'll pray with you for you to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe you're concerned about someone else in your family or a friend that is unsaved. Call us for that too. We'll pray with you that God will give you the grace this season to share the good news with that individual. Is there any better Christmas gift that you could give than to tell somebody Jesus is offering them forgiveness and a new life? That's the best gift of all. But today is the last day that we're offering the series called Christmas, the rest of the story. It's 15 parts and it comes in multiple formats with our great study guide. Please order this today. And today is the last day which we're offering the book by the same title, Christmas, the rest of the story. But put your hand on your heart and I wanna take a moment to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we all know people that need to know you. People that are in sin, people that are blind to their spiritual condition, Holy Spirit, give us the grace to share the good news. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear and the grace to repent. Empower us to be bold enough to do what we need to do and tell them what they need to do. Lord, we would want somebody to do that for us. So help us to do that for somebody else. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with me. I'll see you on Monday. But until then, remember, Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.